Hi, this is Mo Bunnell, your host here at Real Relationships, Real Revenue. I am the author of The Snowball System, and I and my teams have trained over 15,000 high-end professionals all over the world on sound, effective, and authentic business development techniques. I'm joined today by Todd Henry. Todd has written five different very well-selling books. Really exciting. He's a New York Times bestseller. The book I read was his first called The Accidental Creative. We had the we worked with some of the same editing team, which is really exciting. So we know some of the same folks in the book industry. And a client, thanks Clinton, uh, a client had given me The Accidental Creative years ago. And I just absolutely loved it. So when some mutual friends suggested that that I had Todd on the have Todd on the show, I was just elated. I'm like, oh my gosh, that's a that's a brilliant idea. Why didn't I think of Todd? I think I read one of his books. I went back and grabbed it, refreshed my mind on it. And I absolutely love the accidental creative. What I love about this episode is we get into the very specifics of how you can use a, I know this is sound crazy, but how can you use a process of creativity to impact business development? So we're sort of mashing up the two ideas, the, the accidental creative and the snowball system in our Grow Big training. And it's really fun. So in this one, we're gonna do just that. Now, before we get into it, Know that you can get our best and latest thinking on how you can grow your book of business, grow your relationships, and grow your career at growbigplaybook.com. Go to growbigplaybook.com, sign up there. It takes about 20 seconds, and you will get our best insights delivered right to your inbox. It's awesome. Growbigplaybook.com. I write this newsletter myself. comes out weekly. You can usually read it in three or four minutes, and I'm giving you our latest thinking, including all the courses that we publish at no charge. Our complimentary courses are launched there. Really cool stuff. Growbigplaybook.com. All right, here is Todd Henry. Hey, everybody. It's Mo Bunnell, your host here at Real Relationships, Real Revenue. I am beyond excited to bring you Todd Henry. Todd's written several books on lots of different uh, lots of different content. And the one that I've read that I really love is called The Accidental Creative. We have a bunch of uh, friends in common in the book, book industry that help bring accidental creative to life. It sold a ton of copies and Todd has a lot of value to, to help us. So Todd, here's your first question. You know our audience, people with one foot in the delivery of some expertise driven solution uh, they have one foot in business development, and a lot of what they need to do is is sort of do the unexpected. They have to be unique. They have to stand out a little bit. They have to be creative in the way that they approach their client relationships and add value and always work in this proactive, helpful way. So, Todd, what's your big idea on what folks like that can do to stand out, to be creative, to do their best work, to get their clients and prospects attention? All right, go. So uh, one thing I would say is that a lot of people think that they're not creative because they don't make art. Uh, creativity is problem solving. So if you're in business development, if you are in customer relationship management, if you're in any line of work that requires consistent problem solving, you have to be creative every day. Um, the challenge is, I think a lot of people think that creativity is about spontaneity, right? Either you're creative or you're not. Either you can come up with that great idea, that brilliant insight in the moment, or you can't. It's just something that's baked into you. It's, that's not the reality. Most of the successful creative professionals that I encounter have disciplines in their life. They have practices that they build into their daily rhythms, their weekly rhythms to prepare them for those moments when they have to be brilliant. So. For example, they build things like study time into their schedule so that they're filling their mind with valuable stimuli. They have dots to connect. When they're in a conversation with a customer, they can say, hey, you know, it's interesting. I was just reading something the other day that applies to your situation. Let me tell you about that. And, they're, and so they're creatively applying something that they just experienced to the current circumstance. So if you want to be brilliant at a moment's notice, which we all want to do and need to do in order to be successful, you have to begin far upstream from the moment that you need that brilliant idea. And it begins by building practices into your life to prepare you for those moments when you have to deliver great results. Todd, this is so rich and um, it aligns so well with what we teach in the snowball system where there's things that people should do annually, quarterly, monthly, weekly, daily, things like that to stay on top of relationship building, to stay on top of being proactively helpful. So follow up question, you know, in today's world, our professionals are, are 
their, their partners or senior partners, big consulting or law or accounting for big professional services, their account managers, account execs, client execs at big service-based companies, man, they are back to back all day long. They've, they're in these days, we tape, we're taping this in the pandemic and zoom call after zoom call. Um, in the old days, it was flying around the country and getting in at 11 PM and, and then getting up for breakfast and, and having your whole day mapped out the next day at clients or at offices you're visiting internally. So how do people do it, Todd? How do people build in that time in a way that they, uh, they can be creative, you know, your world, they, they can do business development, stay on top of the proactive long-term things, our world. I think you have a lot to add to our audience here. What, what's your best advice? The interesting challenge is we thought that, I think a lot of us thought that working remotely, which most of us have been doing for the last year, was going to give us more time um, but, you know, to, to do things like that. Uh, the, the challenge is that meetings now have absolutely no transaction cost whatsoever. Um, you know, in, in the past, when you had a meeting, you had to schedule travel time to get to the meeting, or you had to schedule time in between the meetings because people had to move from meeting to meeting. And even if you're in the same office space, you have to go to a different floor, or you have to you know, go to a different building or whatever. There was at least some baked in buffer in our schedule. Now, many of us, and I'm, I'm working with a lot of clients, as I'm sure you are, Mo, um, who literally have no buffer from the time they sit down at their laptop in the morning to the time that they end their workday, because it's meeting after meeting after meeting after meeting, because there's no transaction cost. We jump from space to space, you know, with the click of a button. So what that means for all of us, and regardless of whether we're working in person or we're working virtually, what that means for all of us is we have to identify time on the calendar ahead of time to engage in these disciplines. Uh, there's an old saying, and I don't know who said it, I wish I did, where your calendar and your money goes, that shows you what's really important to you. So the reality is if we want to be prepared for those moments when we have to be brilliant, that means we have to look at our calendar ahead of time and say, okay, I'm going to strategically block off time to study. I'm going to strategically block off time to sit and to think about my priorities, to define my most important outcomes, my most important objectives, to time block, to be able to engage in deep creative work on the work that's most important to me. You, you may think, you know, I need to find some time this week to think strategically about how to reach out to this client or how to nurture this relationship. That's not going to happen in the cracks and crevices of your Zoom meetings, right? In, in the 30 seconds between meetings that you might have, you're going to have to strategically time block for that, which might mean you're going to spend a couple of hours feeling really unproductive. Uh, and that's the thing about creativity is that it's rarely efficient. We're not going for efficiency. We're going for effectiveness, uh, long-term effectiveness. So that would be my, my encouragement is, uh, if something is important to you, you find time for it. And it might mean you need to get up an hour earlier. It might mean you need to stay a little later. It might mean you need to carve out some time through the middle of your day to have a bit of space, you know, um, have a morning meeting schedule and an afternoon meeting schedule and try to carve some space through the middle of the day to have, some, some deep work time, some no fly zone time uh, or whatever you want to call it. But um, yeah, I feel like it's a matter of priority and discipline uh, and those who are willing to take that step, that uncomfortable step to carve out strategic time on their calendar are those who are going to see the results on the other side. This is killer, Todd. It's so amazing how our content are just totally aligned. So I want to ask one more big question in this episode. We've got so much more to cover in the next couple episodes. So I got to save some good stuff for that because I have all these <laughs> notes over here. But I think the next logical question that our audience will be interested in is how do they create that no, no, no fly zone, that, that mm -hmm. creative problem solving time. For us in our world, it might be business development time, although it could be pure creative time for, for leadership of their practice, for developing sure. of, of tools that they can use with their clients, things like that. And I, what the thing I find people struggling with the most right now, and I think this will be true after the pandemic wanes, is being able to say no. Mm -hmm. And you've got some great, so let's say they've, they've done what you've said, they've done what I've said, they've scheduled the time, and now somebody tries to get into that time. Um, yeah. And let's say it's not just, you know, they do one hour a day, it's not just one time, it's 10 times in a row or whatever. I'm seeing people really have struggle struggling saying no to that or trimming the, the less effective things that they're doing. And I know you've got some great models for that. So give us your mm -hmm. best advice around how do you say no, or how do you trim the things that you've said yes to before that you want to sort of wind out of? Yeah, so we do have to be very good at pruning and managing our energy. You know, we, we manage our time very well, but we're very not very good often at managing our energy. And one of the primary practices with regard to managing energy that I mentioned in the Accidental Creative is the importance of pruning. 
Just like in a good vineyard, the vine keeper routinely prunes the vine to protect resources for the more mature parts of the vine, uh, because there are only so many resources to go around. You know, if, if, if you just allow the vine to grow indiscriminately, then you're going to end up with a lot of mediocre fruit because there are only so many resources to go around. You can have a little bit of good fruit or a lot of mediocre fruit. And in the same way, uh, we, you know, we can have a lot of mediocre fruit in our life as a result of our efforts, or we can have you know, a select amount of good fruit. So we have to think about our time, not in terms of, uh, you know, we all talk about spending time. We need to think about our time in terms of investment. So me blocking off two hours in, in, on an afternoon in the middle of the week to spend time thinking about, strategically thinking about business development or strategically problem solving for my business or strategically coming up with ideas for a client, that's an investment. Now, when I invest my money, I don't expect to put money in and get a return five minutes later, right? I'm, I'm thinking long-term. I'm thinking uh, strategically that if I invest this money wisely, then long-term, there's going to be a result on the other side. That's the way we need to think about our time as well. So you should have time every week that you spend because we have to do that. We spend time in meetings. We spend time you know, doing our administrative tasks or whatever we have to do. But you should also have a part of your time portfolio that is investment focused. I'm going to invest two or four or six hours of my work week this week in efforts that may not pay off right now, but that are in, uh, an investment in future returns later. If I spend two hours thinking creatively right now, it could come up, it could result in an idea that's going to lead to a million dollars of value, you know, two years from now, um, because the seed of an idea is planted that grows into something more substantial. We have to think about our time in terms of investment, not in terms of something that we spend uh, every day, every week. Todd, I love it. If I, but I want to I want to get super practical on this for our yeah. audience. Let's say somebody's they's, they've bought in. They've got a two hour block next Thursday. They just yeah. get an email for a calendar invite. Says, "Hey, notice that you you might be conflicted, but we really need you at this meeting." Yeah. And let's say you look at let's say our client or our audience looks at that and they're like, "You just you know what? That's not as valuable as this investment time I want to make." But how do they say no? How do they? Well, I'll just give that to you. How do they say no to the things that are less valuable? How do they prune? Well, uh, one thing I would say that, that is very important, it's a consideration, is we have to consider who's asking for our time. If the CEO of the company calls you up and says, I need this hour of your time, that's a very different thing than if a coworker says, hey, I want to get together and hash out some ideas for this client. My belief is that we need to treat this time like, like a meeting with ourselves. Okay. We can't fill every available hour with this kind of time. You know, we can't just block off six hours a day of creative thought time, but when we do block it off, we have to be very strategic and treat it like a meeting with ourselves. So if somebody calls you and says, Hey, uh, you know, I see that you have that time blocked off, but I really need you. You say, I'm sorry, I have a meeting. Is there another time that we could find to meet? Uh, if, if you're able to do that now, and you don't have to say, by the way, I have a meeting with myself. You can say, I have a meeting, right? You treat it like <laughs> right. a meeting with yourself. You can even come up with, I mean, I've had a couple of people tell me they've come up with uh, pseudonyms for this time. So they'll, you know, Bob Johnson or whatever, right? They'll just put that on their calendar in case somebody can see their calendar. So that, but it, really what that is, is it's just a name for a meeting with themselves, right? Um, so it's just something that we have to protect. If it's a priority, we have to protect it. And listen, if people, if people... Uh, if people start to see results from you doing this, which they will, um, then they're going to be much more gracious in allowing this. And that's what I tell leaders in organizations when I work with organizations. Listen, you have to be making the business case for decisions you're making when you're making uh, strategic decisions about how your team spends their time and their resources. You need to make a business case to your manager to protect that time and to protect those resources. And then you need to be constantly engaged in feedback loops with them about the results of your efforts. If people start to see the results of this, they're going to say, you know what, that, that meeting with Bob Johnson, let's just let that go. That's good. That's a good thing that you have that on your calendar. You know, maybe we don't need you quite as much because they're going to see that you're becoming more effective. So the reality is we have to say, we have to say no to things that aren't uh, using our time in the way that we want to use them if we want to invest our time effectively. Um, another really super quick tip um, that I learned from a friend of mine, Ricardo Crespo, who's, who was uh, the global creative chief at 20th Century Fox, and he obviously was being pulled into meetings all the time. 
Uh, and you know, the problem with meetings often the way that we think about them is that we schedule our meetings for 60 minutes by default, right? I want to meet with you. Great. Nine to 10. I want to meet with you. Great. 10 to 11. Well, first of all, that creates zero buffer between our meetings. Second of all, our meetings don't need to be 60 minutes. When we have 60 minutes, we will fill 60 minutes. But often if we carve out a smaller amount of time for our meetings, then we'll find that we can get what we need to get done in a shorter amount of time. So Ricardo, when he was asked to be in a, to, to meet with someone, he would say, great, that, I would love to meet with you. Meet me at the potted plant outside the elevator well on the second floor of building A at 922 tomorrow morning. And they would sort of think that was a little strange, but the reason he did that is because he knew he was coming out of a meeting at 920 with somebody in building A. He was going to be on the second floor. They would meet at that potted plant. They would have five minutes of conversation. The person would get what they needed, and then they would both go on their merry way. Now, if Ricardo said, great, yeah, meet me at my office at 930, they're going to sit there for a half hour. They're going to chat. They're going to talk about their families. They're going to, you know, um, and so it's just a strategic way to you know, try to find, um, try to, try to create effective and efficient meetings, um, you know, just, just kind of by default. And, and the thing I would say about that too, is, you know, I've gotten really good at saying, yeah, Hey, grab your best 10 minutes on my meeting calendar, on my meeting schedule, my meeting link, right. Or grab your best 20 minutes. Like I've gotten really good at defining for people how much time I'm willing to give them instead of saying, yeah, just grab some time on my scheduling tool. Um, because that, sends a signal to them, hey, we're going to get down to business. Uh, we're going to get things done quickly. Um, of course, with you, I said, hey, just take as much as you want, right? Mo, just grab as much time as you want. But, uh, you know, you're, you're a unique case. Is that, yeah, is that okay? I just, 10 days in July, is that fine? That's what I booked. <laughs> it's totally fine. <laughs> well, come I'm looking over, forward I'll... to Tahoe. I am, really. It's going to be great. Yeah, sure. A lot of brainstorming, you know, whiteboards. It's going to be awesome. Todd, that was super effective. And, I, and to put a bow on it, what I, what I like about what you said for audience is one, there's two pieces to it. One is not just saying yes to what somebody asked for right in the beginning, but, but really digging in for how much time do we need and can we handle this in sort of a pass by situation, which can happen virtually or physical by the potted plant. And then the second thing is once you've got that, or the Bob Johnson time that maybe we can pull that through into our later episodes because I think it's funny. That's our that's our investment in our future selves. That's our investment in creativity and building and in nurturing relationships, things like that. Once you've got your Bob Johnson time, is like how do you figure out how to keep it? How do you say no to it? How can you have a script so that when somebody tries to intrude on that, it's very unlikely they can, and if they have to you're rescheduling it right away as opposed to it just evaporates. So, so let's do this. Todd, people are going to want more of all your great content. Where should they go? Uh, the best place to go is toddhenry.com, T-O-D-D-H-E-N-R-Y.com. You can get to my podcast, The Accidental Creative. There you can get to any of my books and all of my writing as well. That's awesome. Thanks for being on the show, folks. Get this. If you like this episode, I know you did. Our next one, I'm going to ask Todd, how can, very specifically, how can we use creativity how can we use all of his teachings to create and close more opportunities? It's going to be great. So that's coming up next. Hey, everybody. It's Mo Bunnell, your host here at Real Relationships, Real Revenue. Here is episode two with Todd Henry. We had a blast in the last one where we talked about some really important ways to carve off time to do your best work, whether that's creatively growing your book of business, your practice, or or your career, or the part of the organization you own, whatever that strategic time, but also we applied it to business development. Obviously, you're watching or listening because of that. So it's really fun to have somebody from outside the, the strict business development realm help us be better people, better professionals, better business developers. And Todd, that's exactly where we're going to go next. So whereas the last episode was a little bit more about a big idea, now I want you to really hone in. When you think about folks that need to create opportunities, that need to get them to create demand, develop relationships, and actually get someone to say yes, to hiring them effectively for retention or, or pure growth purposes, um, what would be your best advice on how somebody can come up with unique ideas, proactively invest, work with a team maybe. You've got some great content on teams. How can you help people? What's your best advice on how they can get in front of people and how they can actually create demand using creativity to get hired? So a couple of things. I mentioned in the last episode that creativity is problem solving. If we want to be effective 
creative professionals, we need to become really, really, really effective at defining problems. If you can define the problem that your client is trying to solve better than they can define the problem they're trying to solve. And not only that, if you can define the problem and offer a couple of quick solutions to that problem in your initial meeting, they're going to love you. Often people are so close to the work that they're doing that they can't see the patterns playing out right in front of them. If you show them that you're willing to spend a bit of time thinking about those patterns and helping them more clearly define what it is they're trying to do, then it's very likely the case that you're going to end up getting the work. You're the one that they're going to turn to when they need help. And that is the creative process. The creative process begins by defining problems effectively. Those who ask the best questions often win because they get closest to the metal. They get closest to the heart of the problem. So we have to be really good at asking questions, asking why, refining, 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 getting to the place of simplicity where we can articulate problems really clearly, speak language that is so precise that our client feels like we're inside their walls, inside their organization, and then offer a couple of solutions that aren't pandering and don't insult them by being too vague or too you know overly simplistic, but that really provide some value to them in a way that maybe they hadn't considered. So we have to begin by defining problems effectively. Um, that's the first thing I always tell people. And in order to do that, you have to, and we talked about this in the last episode, you have to carve out time to, to be able to stop and to think. I often have clients ask me, do you have cameras on the wall of our office? And, you know, because you're, you, you, it's like, you know, exactly what's going on inside of our organization. And my response is always the same. It's, you know, every organization thinks that they're unique. Every organization thinks they're the only one dealing with certain issues. Um, the one thing that you bring to the table from outside the organization is perspective that they don't have because they're only seeing what's inside their four walls. So if you're able to bring some of that outside perspective in and help them look at the problem differently, define the problem differently, and you're able to introduce some language to them that helps them simplify how they address the problem, then I, I believe you're already halfway towards securing a deal with them uh, because I think people really just want somebody who can come in and make their world more simple and can solve problems for them effectively. Yeah. And th th this is just so good. I, it, it's a, again, I know we said this in the last episode, but the alignment between our, our content is, uh, is amazing. Mm -hmm. The four steps that, that we see to get a yes, and this is in the snowball system is listen and learn, create curiosity about how we might be able to solve problems, giving some ideas, just like you just said, is that building everything together. Now, that, at that point, you're actually talking about what the work looks like. And the, so the building everything together invokes something called the Ikea effect. People buy into what they help create. So the idea there is actually talking about the project or the or the extra thing that's going to be purchased, whatever. And then the fourth thing is gain approval. And what we find is that is the easiest step in the world, closing, if you will, because if you've done the other three well beforehand. So back to listen and learn and create curiosity, those first two steps, Todd, um, you just really, you just so well artic articulated those pieces. Um, and a lot of times we'll s clients will ask us, where, where, sh where should I change from when I'm asking questions to where I'm offering those solutions? And we talk about it's at the point you can articulate their situation. So can you go a little deeper in your view? You just said, uh, I love your metaphor there. Like clients have asked you or the story, clients have asked, gosh, do you have cameras on the walls? It feels like you just articulated what's going on here and you've only been talking to us 20 minutes. So Todd, what are what's your best advice on the kinds of questions you ask that the person feels that you understand them as you make that transition to create curiosity and, and give them on some ideas on how you might be able to solve those issues? So one of the challenges I think for any person who's working with clients is to not layer your expectations onto the client, to not come in and say, oh, I know, I know what you're dealing with here. Let me explain to you your business, right? Um, that is a sure way to offend the people you're trying to serve and to make it feel like the last thing you want to do is make it feel like you're coming in with a boilerplate, a uh, boilerplate solution to them. People don't want boilerplate solutions. Um, they want custom solutions. And so I always have a working hypothesis coming in to a conversation. 
Um, I think, I suspect, I probably know based upon the reason you reached out to me, what could be going on. And so I like to think of it in terms of concentric circles. I start with very broad questions. Um, all, for example, for the last year, one of the things that I have been asking at the very beginning of a client engagement when somebody contacts me is, how have things changed for you since we started working remotely? And that's a great question to get people, because I, I work a lot with people who are trying to lead teams of problem solvers, teams of creative people. You know, I help them develop systems and practices. I help them identify places where they might be stuck. I help them ask better questions. I help them collaborate more effectively. Well, you know, that kind of a broad question begins to give me some points of traction with them that I can poke at, I can start exploring. So, um, you know, one thing that I'm hearing very, very often is, uh, you know, our people are burned out. They're completely overwhelmed. Everybody thought they wanted to work from home, but now that they're working from home, everybody's burned out. And that begins to give me some opportunity to ask questions. Okay, well, help me understand, um, you know, wh where did expectation not line up with reality when it comes to that? What kinds of things are you seeing? What cues are you seeing that are telling you that your people are burned out? What kinds of conversations are you having? So again, I am in exploratory mode. I'm really trying to figure out, um, okay, what are some of the, because again, I'm coming in with a working hypothesis. I have about seven different areas I'm thinking could be the problem here, you know, uh, based upon my experience with other companies, but I'm trying to really zero in on which one or two of these are really most likely the prominent issue in your organization. And as I continue to ask questions, my concentric circles get smaller and smaller until finally I'll say, you know, something to the effect of, uh, it sounds to me like you have a couple of ghost rules in your organization. Um, does this sound familiar? That'll never work around here. Or uh, so-and-so will never go for that. Or we might as well not do the work anyway because it's just going to change in the end at the last minute. Or, you know, so I'll start getting really specific. And that's the moment at which they start saying, do you have cameras on the wall of our office? And the reality is it's, it's sort of like if you watch a really good mentalist, uh, you know, a really good, uh, you know, like a medium or a mentalist, and you know, you can kind of figure out what their shtick is. I mean, they're kind of like, you know, these very broad. Did you have? Is there a woman in your life whose letter, you know, whose name started with the letter M, right? Yes, my aunt Mary. Oh my gosh, she was. Oh, okay, yeah. And then they're sort of like closing in and getting. Um, it's sort of the same thing in a way where you're just starting with these, you know, sort of broad questions of working your way in. I'm not saying anything that is a surprise to people. Uh, anybody who's been doing this work for any period of time, who's been working with clients, knows that's probably the best approach. But the problem is that as we get more comfortable with what we do, we start coming in with solutions instead of coming in with questions. Um, the solutions don't come until later. First of all, you have to really be curious. You have to truly want to serve people and truly want to understand what's going on. You have to engage with empathy. Every single client thinks that they are unique. And I'm, I think I mentioned this, every single client thinks they are the only one in the history of humanity who's ever dealt with any of this stuff. But again, like I said in the last episode, I come in with like, they're probably like five to seven things. One of these is probably the thing you're primarily struggling with. Like, I just know that I've worked with so many companies. I know it's probably one of these five to seven things, but I don't want you to know that until I've asked you a lot of questions. And then I can say, okay, let me introduce a framework to you uh, and see if any of this resonates. And that to me, that's been the best, the best approach. Um, and it requires a lot of forethought and it requires a lot of strategic thinking. And sometimes things that I say in the moment feel spontaneous, but I've spent maybe a half hour to an hour really thinking about the client ahead of time. So when I say that one liner that sounds so spontaneous to them, I actually put a lot of thought into that ahead of time. Uh, and they just think, wow, this is, how can we not hire you? You just came up with that spontaneous insight in the moment. Well, I spent a lot of time thinking about you prior to this call, right? Yeah. 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 Well, Todd, I, I, that is so good. So I want to, I want to give a, a lightning round question on this and, and, and then we'll tell folks where they can get more Todd Henry, because I know they're going to want it. Background and then lightning round question. The background of what you just said just aligns perfectly with everything we teach. But the thing we see that gets in the way of doing exactly what you said, and I'm going to put a, I'm going to say this bluntly, <clears throat> audience, I'm looking at you. It's fear. 
Yeah. It is absolute fear. So what people do when they feel pressure to grow their book of business, when they feel like they've got this perfect uh, introduction and they don't want to mess it up, is they fall backwards to a crutch. A lot of times that's PowerPoint or it's the marketing materials. And they want to show up with this PowerPoint and start with them and read about how great they are and that they've got this accolade and they work with that client and these are their mission and values of their company. Look, we're honest, we said so on slide three. And they they start things off with this really, from the, from the buy side, really boring thing about them as opposed to starting with questions. So a lightning round question to you is, gosh, you, you, because you're a business developer yourself, you're an expert yourself in how you, um, how you, how you work with organizations. What's your advice, uh, how somebody should shed that fear and adopt this process you're talking through of asking general questions, walking in with a blank slate in their mind and zeroing in over time to a specific solution and doing that it really is human to human as opposed to relying on, I am going to say these things in this order in this PowerPoint. Right. So give us your best advice there. Yeah. Your marketing materials are tools for them to justify the purchase decision, not, mm. uh, you know, reasons they will make the purchase decision. So, um, you know, it's important to have those and there's a time for them for certain because they're probably going to have to make a case to their organization as well. Right. So they, they need all of that information, but, at the end of the day, what they want to know is, can you solve my problem? Can you do for me what I want you to do or what I need you to do? And that, you know, everybody wants to work with a human being. Nobody wants to work with a company. Nobody says, you know, hey, let's hire this company. No, they, they want to work with people. They want to work with, you know, curious people who can solve their problem. And if you can solve their problem, then they're, you know, the, the marketing materials are going to be uh, the, the reason that they can justify that expenditure to their company or your background or your experience or whatever. That's, that's all fine. And it's all necessary, but that's not what they want to know going in. They want to know, can you solve my problem? So the fear aspect, I think, is uh, really rooted in insecurity in a lot of ways. There's a guy named Neil Fury who does research into procrastination and he'll often bring people into a room and he'll put a wood plank on the floor and he'll ask them, could you walk the, the length of this plank if I ask you to? And they'll say, well, yeah, of course, it's a wood plank on the floor. Why wouldn't I be able I'd have, I have to be drunk not to be able to walk a wood plank on the floor, of course. And he'll say, great. Now imagine I take that plank and I suspend it 100 feet in the air between two buildings. Now could you walk the length of that plank? And they'll look at the imaginary plank and look at him and say, no way, are you kidding? I'd have to be drunk. No way am I walking a wood plank 100 feet in the air. Well, what's changed about the technical skill required to walk the plank? Absolutely nothing. If you could do it on the ground, you can do it in the air. What's changed are the perceived consequences of failure, which in this case is plummeting to your death. So I kind of get it, right? But um, <laughs> I would submit to you, Mo, that many of us artificially escalate planks. We artificially escalate the perceived consequences of failure to the point that we don't act. We don't take strategic risk on behalf of a client. I have had, op I've had moments in uh, biz dev you know, uh, engagements where I've gone in and I've, you know, been working on trying to secure a client that I, I was incredibly uncomfortable and I felt almost like I, I may have blown it because maybe I, for whatever reason, you know, felt like maybe my ideas weren't sufficient enough, or maybe my questions weren't good enough, or maybe my framework wasn't aligned enough with what they were kind of working. And they came back and they're great. Let's, let's green light it. Let's go. Um, and the reason is because they saw I had, I was invested in helping them solve their problem. And they really liked the fact that I was willing to put myself out there and really fully go all in on helping them define and solve their problem. That's what they wanted to see. And I've got all this stuff I can point to that I've done and all these companies I've worked for and all that. And that's fine. But what they really wanted to know is, are you going to be in the weeds with us? Are you really going to make, are you really going to uh, try to understand us and really help us? Um, and, and once they saw that, that's, that's really what they were investing in. They weren't investing in all of this experience, all that's necessary to justify the purchase. But I mean, it's like they say, you know, often automobile commercials are not really about selling you a car. It's about making people who have already bought that car feel better. And in some ways, some of our, our collateral is really just about making them feel better about the decision they've made to work with us. Right. Um, it's like almost like a post-purchase decision uh, sort of affirmation in a way. Um, not always the case, not obviously, but I, you know, I just think we need to rely less on that and more on that 
personal relationship. I can help you. I can help you solve your problem. You know, I, I, I can help you identify those patterns and speak more meaningfully about the problems that are plaguing you. Yes, Todd, man, I mean, you just, you articulated that the way I've rarely seen before. So I just love the idea of marketing is to justify not to hire, that people want to get in the weeds with you. So how you're, how you're interacting with them in the purchasing process is giving them a hint towards, do you have your sleeves rolled up? Are you trying to dig in? Are you truly trying to figure out what my needs are? Whereas if we counterpoint that with, I'm showing with PowerPoints, that's hinting to the future that says, I'm going to talk to you. I am the expert. I will tell you what to do. And to your point, I don't think that person wins very often. So where should people go to get more amazing parts of your big brain like you've shared with us on the show? Yeah. If you want to know more, you can go to toddhenry.com. You can access my podcast, The Accidental Creative there, or any of my books and writings. Todd, this is so good. We're going to promote the heck out of not only all the episodes, but this one, this one, you just absolutely, absolutely crushed it. You did on the last one too, but this one is so, <laughs> it's so meaty and meaningful to our folks. So, hey, everybody, I know you love this one. Go back and watch the last one because there's some great setup in that. And in our next episode, I'm going to ask Todd, what can we do? How can we use creativity? How can we use all of his content to deepen relationships with the people who matter most to us? Thank you, Todd. Thank you. Hey, everybody. It's Mo Bunnell, your host here at Real Relationships, Real Revenue. We're going to do a quick episode this time. I'm super excited to have Todd Henry. The last two episodes, he has crushed it with lots of meeting content on how we can deepen our ability to bring in business and how we can create and close more opportunities. Todd, in this one, I want to ask you, Using all your content, all five books, all the keynote speeches you've given over your whole lifetime, what's your number one tip on how people can deepen relationships? If something's important to you, it becomes a priority. And I think that's the challenge. I think for a lot of people, we're very busy and we treat relationships like obligations instead of like investments. We talked on another episode about the importance of treating time like an investment. We have to think about our relationships in the same way. There are a handful of things that, that, tend to happen as we become successful professionally. Um, one of them is that we tend to see our relationships through a lens of transaction. Um, what can I give to you? What can you give to me? Rather than as a means of enriching our, uh, our life and uh, helping us be more creative. We need other people in our life to speak truth to us. We need other people in our life to, um, to reveal patterns that maybe we don't see. We need people in our life who can help us um, see the world through new eyes, uh, you know, inspire us. And we need to be that for other people. And that requires intentional effort. So my challenge to you is, do you have anybody in your life that you're routinely getting with because you bring something to their life, they bring something to your life, and you're using one another in that way, you're building into one another in that way to help one another become better at what you do. And then also for those who are leaders of organizations, you need people in your life to speak truth to you. So I was uh, speaking to the Air Force uh, a couple of years ago and uh, to, at Air Academy, um, which is sort of their senior officer uh, training facility. And um, one of the other speakers, there was a general, uh, an army general, and he came up to me in the green room and asked me something about creativity. And I was so stunned. I mean, I, I, you know, if you've ever stood in the presence of a general, it's a little bit overwhelming, just a little bit. Right. Um, but I did have the, the presence of mind to say, what, what is the most important thing I should know about leadership? And without missing a beat, I mean, it was like, he had obviously thought about this a lot because he came right back to me and he said, you need people in your life to speak truth to you before you realize you need people in your life to speak truth to you. By the time you realize you need it, it's already too late because it's going to be hard to find people who are willing to tell you the truth once, once you've already achieved a measure of success, because now they need something from you, right? So they're going to tell you what you want to hear more often than they're going to tell you what you need to hear. So, uh, you know, we have to carve out space in our lives to have those kind of meaningful relationships. And we need to give people windows into our lives, especially as leaders, to let them tell us what they really see, not just what we want to see. I love it, Todd. In, in the Accidental Creative, you talk about creating circles of people that Get, you can share ideas with. You talk about head-to-heads, things like that. And I love those. So pick, you You choose one of those two, which, which, or you choose any method you want. How about that? I want, because yeah. you've got four other books too. What's yeah. your best method 
to surround yourself that can speak with, with people that can speak truth to you, that can help you accomplish things that you never thought you could, you know, things like that. We, g- give us your best. So let's talk about the head to head. I think that's a great tactic because especially right now in the world of Zoom, right? Or in the world of virtual meeting. Um, so a head to head is you you choose one person and you know they're, they're going to agree to meet with you. And the idea is you meet every so often and you share something that you've learned since the last time you got together. So maybe it's a book that you've read. Maybe it's a documentary you watch. Maybe it's you know uh, a conversation you have with an expert in some field. You're going to share with them what you've learned. They're going to share with you what they've learned. And then you're going to talk about how it applies in your work. So it's sort of like what we're doing right now except I wouldn't be talking about my content. I would be talking about a, a book I'm reading or you know, a video that I watched or something, and I would be teaching you, and then you would be teaching me. This accomplishes a couple of things. First of all, it reinforces in my mind those concepts and principles because when you have to teach something, it internalizes it more deeply. And second of all, we're leveraging one another's experience to grow our capacity to see the world in new ways. And we're also, not only that, but we're talking about the application of it. So if I'm sharing with you about a book I just read, hey, let me tell you about this book and let me tell you about the principles and here's how it's affecting me. And then we have a conversation about that and let's talk about how that applies to our work. What are we gonna do as a result of this? We're helping one another get better at what we do. And so that's a that's a head-to-head, a very simple, and, and by the way, very introvert-friendly way of building into relationships. When I start talking about getting together with groups of people, a lot of people start getting sweats and shakes and all that. I get it, I totally get it. Um, so there's a very introvert friendly way of, of doing that as well. Well, I love it. We've talked a lot about, uh, in our books and our trainings, uh, speeches, accountability partners, but I don't, and now that you mentioned this aspect of it, a lot of times I think we overemphasize the fact that, that you'll make commitments to each other to do the hard things. And we, I think we do well on that, but I think we can build in this training each other or this, here's what I'm experiencing, whether it's within our little realm of business development or in your broader realm of just doing great creative work. So Todd, I love this idea, meaty episode, packs a punch. Where should people go to get more Todd Henry? Uh, ToddHenry.com. You can access my podcast, The Accidental Creative, or any of my books and writings there. Awesome. I'm a fan. All right. Thanks, Todd. Hey, everybody. In our next episode, I'm going to ask Todd, and I know he's got some amazing content here. How do we hack our own habits to have long-term success? Hi, everybody. It's Mo Bunnell, your host here at Real Relationships, Real Revenue, back again with Todd Henry. Incredible last three episodes on lots of media content. I'll let you go back and listen to those. On this one, Todd uh, Todd is, has a particular expertise in helping large groups implement create creativity, innovation, things like that. And it's about processes, not about just some random spark of an idea you get on a walk with your dog. So Todd, tell us this. How do we hack our own habits to have the best chance of long-term success? The reality is that those who succeed long-term, those who have longevity in their career and are able to continue to be what I call prolific, brilliant, and healthy over the long term. You know, prolific meaning doing a lot of work, brilliant meaning doing good work, and healthy meaning working sustainably. It doesn't mean that we always, it doesn't mean we don't, we don't feel stressed. It doesn't mean we're not you know, overextended from time to time. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about working sustainably long term, right? Those who are able to do that are people who have disciplines, who have practices in their life. They carve out space. And some of them do it unwittingly, by the way. They don't even know they're doing it. They just do it sort of because they realize they have a need for it and it just becomes part of their life. They tend to have practices in five key areas. And I wrote about this in The Accidental Creative. The first one is focus. They're really good at routinely stepping back and asking, what am I really trying to do here? What problems am I solving? Because creativity isn't about projects. It's about problems. Our minds are not wired to do projects. Our minds are wired to solve problems. So think about like the way that you, you know, uh, you know, me hungry, me need food, right? Like me cold, me need shelter. Like you think about like the most rudimentary human needs. They're not projects. Nobody said, you know, I should build a cave. I should, I should go carve out a cave and maybe I could decorate it. And we could, you know, no, it was like, yeah, I have a problem. I need to solve it. So, um, we need to get really good at defining those problems. What are the problems I'm really trying to solve right now? And then winnowing those down to the most important problems so we can allocate our finite resources to them. The second is relationships. So we have focus, we have relationships. 
we need other people in our life to help us solve problems effectively. Um, creativity is a team sport. Innovation is the collective grasp for the next. I need to see what you're seeing. You need to see what I'm seeing. We put those pieces together. And as Steve Jobs said, creativity is just connecting dots. We need all of our dots out there in front of us so that we can connect them more meaningfully. And teams that are really good at that are the ones who make progress most swiftly because they're communicating about what they're seeing, what they're experiencing, what they're, you know, the problems they're trying to solve. Um, the third area is energy. We're good at managing time. We're terrible at managing energy. So we have to be really good at making sure we're investing our, what Lewis Hyde calls emotional labor, our discretionary energy in ways that are helping us create more value in the future rather than just managing the value we've already created in the present, right? So we have to be really good at saying no, at pruning, at making sure that we're investing our energy in meaningful places. The fourth area is stimuli. These are the dots we put into our head that we can connect later. So do you have a discipline or a practice of study, of inspiring yourself, of putting yourself in circumstances where you're seeing the world through new lenses, through new eyes? Those are really important because we get into ruts. The best way to get yourself out of a rut is to put stimulus into your brain that jogs the way that you're seeing things, that forces you to see things through a new lens. Um, and so I would encourage you to, to think about that in terms of practices. And the final area is hours. So we have focus, relationships, energy, stimuli, hours. We often think about our times in terms of time in terms of efficiency, but not in terms of effectiveness. We need to be making time investments that may not pay off for a week, two weeks, three weeks, a month, a year, but we need to be thinking about our, making a certain number of investments every week. That can look like having idea time on your calendar that might look a lot like you sitting around thinking about a problem you're trying to solve. Not very efficient in the short term. A lot of managers aren't comfortable with that because what are you doing right now? What am I paying you for? Well, I'm investing in future value. You're not paid for the time you spend, you're paid for the value you create during that time. So we need to be thinking about our time in terms of investment, not just in terms of uh, efficiency. So focus, relationships, energy, stimuli, hours. Those are the five uh, areas where I encourage people to build practices. It's where I see practices in the lives of people who are prolific, brilliant, and healthy. Oh my gosh, that was a great tie back from, from the beginning. Todd, what I love about it is it spells fresh. So even when you started getting into it, I memorized fresh when I, um, you know, those five things. And uh, when I first read Accidental Creative, I reread it this week and I'm like, oh, yes, fresh. Like I knew what was coming because it's such a neat little mnemonic. And you know, what's funny is that, that uh, we share an editor, uh, David Moldauer, and yeah. uh, originally ours was time. And David, I re still remember the conversation. David said, right now, Todd, you have Frest and Frest is not very memorable. <laughs> so he was the one who changed time to hours. So it would be fresh. So it'd be memorable, which is so funny. That's what a great editor does, right? It's so funny. It was Frest. <laughs> it was. I, it, was it was so close. And yet I, I didn't see the obvious pattern. See, this is why we need relationships, right? Yes. This is why we need yes. other people to help us see patterns because it was right in front of me and I, I, <laughs> I didn't even consider it. It was just right there. <laughs> and how funny it is. We both know Dave and have gone through the same experience with him as an editor. That's so awesome. Well, when I read it, you know, you don't really smack people in the face with this in the book. It just sort of, it's laid out there, and but the, the words are bolded. And I saw fresh. I'm like, oh, that's cool. And as a reader, it was even better, Todd, that like you didn't you didn't hit me over the head with it. I got to sort of discover it myself. And I think that made it even more meaningful to me. But years later, I remembered it this week. And I'm like, oh, yeah. Once I saw focus, I'm like, yep, relationships, energy, stimuli. Oh, oh that's powers. great. Like, just like that. Years later. So it matters. And what's so cool about it, audience, pay attention, is this aligns so well with the snowball system and growing trading. Focus. What opportunities are you focused on? Fill out your opportunity list. Have your stick that on your wall. Relationships. Your protomoi list. Todd, that's a Greek word. It means first among equals. Who am I going to put in my inner circle? Stick that on a wall so we're always be thinking of them. Um, energy. That's not in the snowball system, but it's really important. <laughs> Stimuli. You know, thinking of all the interesting interesting things that are coming across your desk that you can share with others and hours so important to dedicate to whether it's your broader creative pursuits, growing a business, whatever, or it's hours spent on business development, however you want to apply it, blocking that off, having a system around it. Folks, this is what Todd teaches large creative groups as organizations is how do you have this process? Then what do you do quarterly, weekly, um, 
a monthly was your other one, quarterly, monthly, and weekly. What systems do you have to sort of have like agile for creative pursuits and for creative teams? That's what Todd does. So Todd, I just couldn't thank you more for being on the show. This has been absolutely fantastic. I know the answer, but our audience may not. If they drop into this last episode, where should they go to get more Todd Henry? Uh, the best place is toddhenry.com. And there you can access the Accidental Creative Podcast, which is my show, and also all of my books and writing. And folks, if you go there, you can learn how to be fresh, not fressed. That's what they should, <laughs> have. <laughs> they should know. This has been a blast, Todd. Thank you so much for being on the show. Hey, everybody, audience, I'm going to tape a recap episode with the top three meaty things that I learned from Todd. We're going to apply it to business development. I'm going to do that right away. That's coming up next in the podcast series. Todd, thanks so much for being on Real Relationships, Real Revenue. I just thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you. Hi, everybody. It's Mo Bunnell, your host here at Real Relationships, realrevenue.com. I'm author of The Snowball System, and I and my teams have trained over 15,000 high-end professionals all over the world on sound, effective, and authentic business development techniques. Wow, I, had a, I just had a great time interviewing Todd Henry. Todd is author of several best-selling books. The one I've read is called The Accidental Creative. Uh, client and friend Clinton got this for me years ago. I read it, loved it. And then some mutual friends, we, Todd and I know a bunch of people in common in, in mostly the, the publishing and speaking industry. And when somebody mentioned, gosh, you need, to, you need to have Todd on your show, I thought, man, I've heard that name before. But it had been long enough ago that I'd forgotten I'd read the accidental creative. But I've got my big library here, a quick scan, and I realized, oh, Todd Henry, yeah, he's awesome. And uh, I really love the accidental creative. And, and as I just flipped through it, I remembered all the things I had learned from it. And boy, reached out to Todd and he was excited to be on the show. So we just, we just recorded the first four episodes where really the focus was on Todd and they were just chocked full of insights. All the episodes were absolutely fantastic. The second one I think was my favorite, but every single one of them had really deep insights that, that we can lose, use using Todd's expertise of creativity and in creating more creativity at scale within large organizations, which is Todd's what, what he focuses on. And, um, and then secondly, applying that to business development, our world. So those four episodes, if you haven't listened or watched, watched them, uh, go back and check them out. These were some of our best work that, that we've done here at Real, Real Relationships, Real Revenue. Every episode packs a punch. In this one, what I'm going to do is recap the big three things that I learned from interviewing Todd. And, and I reread Accidental Creative over the weekend, looking at my highlights that I'd created years ago. And uh, it just brought a lot of really, really meaningful uh, ideas and insights back into my mind that, that you know, after you read a book, things, things fade, and it's brought them back to the forefront. Really cool stuff. So I'll recap the big three things I learned from Todd in this episode. Now, before we get into it, you know the drill. I always like to talk about growbigplaybook.com. Grow Big Playbook is a place where you can go, sign up, takes 20 seconds, and you can get our best insights dropped right into your inbox. If you are looking to create a bigger book of business, to, to foster deepen relationships, to grow your career because you don't want to just be an expert, but you also want to be good at, at bringing in business for people to hire that expertise. If those things sound familiar, if, if business development or client retention and growth are one of the most important things for your career at this point, then head over to growbigplaybook.com, sign up there, 20 seconds, and that 20 second action is going to be an annuity of insights. Remember, I was an actuary in a former life, so I love the word annuity. That's going to be an annuity of insights that you get for the rest of your life. And there's no charge for it. Every week I write a little newsletter. It's called Grow Big Playbook. And um, I put so much heart and soul into this thing, thinking of what's the big in insight I can share this week with everybody who signs up. And I write that myself. I send it out. And I even connect you to other things like the science you need to learn. Uh, if we do, if we as we develop complementary courses, which we've got half a dozen of those now, we're going to add more over time. That's where I announce those. There's so much value in Grow Big Playbook that that 
it's just almost crazy not to sign up for it. So go over to growbigplaybook.com, sign up there, 20 seconds, and you will not regret it. It's awesome stuff. Okay, so what did I learn from Todd Henry? I learned a lot. It was sort of hard to, to get it down to three things, to be honest. But the first of the three things was realizing the, the parallel between how long scale creativity is a process, just like business development is a process. I view myself as much of a creator as I do a teacher. To, to write a book, to have 800 pages in our Grow Big training, whether it's our core Grow Big training for, for frontline professionals or our Grow Big leader training for people who manage them or people who manage the people who manage them. And both of those pieces of content were are, are really my life's work. Um, the snowball system and, and grow big training. And to, to synthesize, to research, to find what actually works, not just stuff that worked for one person a long time ago, which a lot of sales books, if you will, and I'm using air quotes if you're listening, because I'm, I'm laughing at that. A lot of sales books are sort of like, this stuff worked for me, so it'll work for you. But, but the problem with those are a lot of times they're a little bit more oriented around manipulation or getting some poor sucker to sign on the bottom line and, and increasing deals and using manipulative tactics that for me, that makes me want to go take a shower. Like I, I, from the very beginning, I wanted to create a business development methodology that would work with authenticity, that would work where it was a win for the other side as much as it was a win for me or my organization. That you could do, I wanted a system so transparent that you could actually tell somebody what you're doing and tell them why it's working and they would love it because it's novel, it's unique, and it's got their best interest in mind. To put a fine point on that, we've actually had our clients, and this is no exaggeration, we've actually had our clients, when it makes sense, invite their clients to our training classes, sit alongside them and say, this is how we're growing our business with you and they're learning at the same time. Now that's really cool. I know that sounds crazy, but when the other side has some kind of marketing or business development role themselves, and, and our clients are helping them implement something around that, it can totally make sense for our clients to invite their clients to the class, they purchase it, they sit alongside them, and our, our content is so transparent that that feels awesome to all involved. So my point with all that story is that I feel like I'm a creator. I couldn't find that thing in the marketplace. So over a couple decades, I've invented that thing. And it turns out a lot of other people want that thing. So as I was talking with Todd and really digging deep into the live version of the Accidental Creative and all of his other great content, it really became clear that any kind of long-term sustainable work, whether it's creativity, growing a business, or, or, or learning a language, or a musical instrument, or anything at scale that's important, it takes a long time to get there, almost by definition. And as soon as you realize that, there's a process behind it. Anybody who's successful, a great author, a great athlete, a great business person, a great business developer, an artist, Anybody who's great at something learned it and they earned it and they developed some kind of process to get there. We've done worldwide work at Sotheby's, the high-end art auctioneers, the people who are calling on uh, very affluent people, typically billionaires, and consigning or selling them really high-end art. Sotheby's and Christie's own a basically a duopoly for the, the highest art in the world, about 80, 80 to 85% market share for things a million dollars and up. And as we've gotten to know the Sotheby's folks, who of course know the artists, same thing holds true there. It's a process. If you look out how, if you look at how much art somebody like Picasso cranked out, multiple items per day once he became a full-time artist for the rest of his life, there was a process to that. He didn't just wait for inspiration to strike. He had a system. And the same thing goes true, is true for any creator, and the same thing is true for any great business developer.
I'll tie up this first element, this idea of creativity or business development as a process. I'll tie it up with a quote. And I'm actually gonna pull out my copy here of Accidental Creative because when I read this quote, it just, it hit me like a Mack truck. I loved it. So this is by Jack London, obviously a very prolific author. And he says this, you can't wait for inspiration. You have to go after it with a club. You can't wait for inspiration. You have to go after it with a club. Yes, <laughs> Jack. And I love that Todd put that in the Accidental Creative because when you're trying to invest in an important client relationship, when you're trying to be proactively helpful, when you're trying to exceed a client's expectations, you can't wait for inspiration. You have to go after it with a club because the time you've got is right now. And that implies you've got a process. You're doing specific things quarterly, monthly, weekly, daily to stay on top of a creative pursuit or to stay on top of business development. That's thing one. You got to have a process. Tons more on that in the accidental creative. If you want the creative angle, tons more on that in the conclusion of the snowball system. I map it out very specifically. Here's what you should think about doing annually, quarterly, monthly, weekly, daily. If you want to make business development a process, if you want to stay on top of it, and if you want to keep climbing. So more research, more resources there. All right. The second thing, I loved this as I, uh, as I talk with uh, Todd, and he articulated this maybe better than anybody I've seen. What, do you, what should you do in a first meeting? So this was in the episode where we talked about creating and closing more opportunities. So go back and listen to this if you want more. But the nut of it is, and in fact, I highly recommend you go back and watch that episode because it was so good. But the nut of it is this, that you want to walk into your first meeting, and I like Todd's words here, with a working hypothesis of what might be going on. You might not know a ton. Maybe it's a, a referral that you got in. Maybe it's somebody followed you up after one of your lead generation tactics, lead, lead tactics, more on that in the snowball system. Uh, for whatever reason you're having your first conversation. And the person probably knows a little bit about you, at least the, 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 enough that they wanted to chat. And you know a little bit about them. If nothing else, you've, you've got a few lines and an email and, and you know what company they work for. Well, Todd's words, you can walk in with a working hypothesis, but what he does is, is so important here. He doesn't go in with a PowerPoint or a marketing collateral. I mean, if he does that, it's a leave behind, but he walks in with questions in preparation. That's exactly what we teach in our training. But I liked how Todd, with his creative mind, talked about it. He starts with broad questions, and as he envisions this in concentric rings, and narrows in until he can articulate back specifically what's going on at the client. Now, the four steps we talked about, and I'm going to go a little deeper in this episode than I did in the, in the one where I just, it was more of a drive-by on this. But the four steps that, that it takes to get a yes. Tons of science behind this. This is in the snowball system. And this is written, these are written from our perspective. Listen and learn, create curiosity, build everything together, gain approval. So step one, listen and learn. Two is create curiosity. Three is build everything together. And four is gain approval. Whenever anybody comes to us and they say, gosh, I've got this person, they're, they're, they're really good at creating opportunities, they're horrible at closing, you know, something like that. It's never, in working on this for a couple decades, it's never really a problem about closing. There aren't magical words you just say at the end uh, to get somebody to say yes. If they are, they're, they're manipulative and they're not the kind of thing we teach. Somebody, if, if you're doing that four-step process right, the, the client or the prospect is actually pulling you to take the next step because they're so excited about working with you. So let's break down the first couple. So listen and learn and then create curiosity. What we want to do first is start with questions. The way Todd articulate this broader at first and moving into very specific in his mental model of concentric rings, zeroing in, if you will, on being able to articulate what's really going on. He had very specific questions he gave a couple episodes ago. That's the one on create close opportunities. You can go back and, and hear his specific versions there. From our perspective, what we see is that you, by, by going in and asking questions first, you get a triple win. One is great questions. 
And this is some research by Dr. Diana Tamir. Great questions light up the pleasure center of the person's mind. So they're literally, literally they're on a high. The pleasure center is the same area that lights up like crazy, crazy if you're on stimulants. So if you ask good questions, and the, and the thing to focus in on here is things that allow somebody to give their personal opinion on things, how things are going around the office, whatever. If you ask broad-based questions to get their perspective on that, you will light up the pleasure center. That's win one. Win two, you're gonna learn their priorities in their words. Those things are important to tease out. Their priorities in their words. That's important because if you can play those back, they're gonna feel heard. They're gonna feel like you get it. The third part of the triple win is that the more they talk in what scientists call self-disclosing information, this is just those personal opinions that, that we talked about, not only does it give people a high, the Dr. Diana Tamir research, but it strongly correlates to likability of you. And I think it's so funny, I laugh about this a lot, the more they talk, especially in this way we're talking about now, and the less we do, the more they like us. And we know by research by Dr. Jerry Berger at, at Santa Clara University that we that people spend more money with people that they like. So we have a higher chance of getting a yes in the end if we ask these really great questions. So this idea of walking in with, with a, a working hypothesis, Todd's words, I love that, starting with broad questions and have thought thought about this for a while, 30, 60 minutes, doing some really meaty prep for the for the meeting. You know, you can get, you can grab the dynamic meeting prep form in the snowball system um, from chapter nine, um, if, you, if you want this. But there's a whole form on how to do prep before a, a prospective client meeting. But the idea is you're walking in with a working hypothesis, Todd's words, you are framing the meeting appropriately. What, what's a win for today? And then you're really thinking through some questions you wanna ask. Our model is called the Gravitas model. That's in the snowball system too. But in general, from Todd's perspective, starting broad and zeroing in. At the point that you can articulate back to the client or the prospect what's going on, it sounds like what's going on is blank. This is where you're gonna bring back their priorities and their words that you've learned but you're gonna merge it with your perspective as being an outsider, as an expert, as seen this movie before, and being able to articulate that, that is incredibly powerful. Because at that moment, at that moment, that's when the client wants to learn more about what you know. Start with them. At the moment we can articulate their situation, blending their priorities and their words with our unique expertise from having solved this exact issue before. That's the moment where you pivot to step two, create curiosity, and you say, hey, gosh, would it be helpful to, to, to hear how, you know, how we've, in general, how we've tackled this before, or you know, some of the things we've learned in doing this kind of work to, to solve this particular issue? That's where you make the transition to create curiosity, and if done in that order, they are leaning in, they're exciting. Turns out that that curiosity is an intrinsic motivator. You don't need a reward at the end of it to, to want to pursue it. So when somebody's more curious, they're leaning in. Their science shows people remember more when they're curious. They hire people more when they were curious about their services and they're paying attention more. So if doing it in the order where we start with questions about them and then we turn the light on us, we're in a great position. And what so many people do before they go through our trainings is they flip it and they start with themselves. Here's the PowerPoint. Here's our marketing materials. Look how great I am. I got these awards. I'm Chambers rated, whatever. And that has been seen by the buy side, by the buyer, by the decision makers so many times before in their career. It's an immediate turnoff. You may have just met them, but if you start with talking about us and potentially Particularly, if you start with a PowerPoint, I'm being real direct here, you are not starting with a clean slate. There's a behavioral science element called consequence history. And immediately that person's putting you into, oh, you're like all those other people that I didn't hire, that didn't follow back up, and that seems like everybody else. Simply because you're using the tool that all of them used. So that's the key. We wanna start with them first. Yes, we have insights. Yes, we're gonna share them. Yes, we have expertise they need, but we wanna start with them first, 
and then merge it into ours. Really important, really important. And I thought, uh, I thought Todd's explanation of what marketing materials are for is really important. I'll finish up the second point with that. Your marketing materials, your PowerPoint, they're to have the decision maker justify their decision. They're for circulation around afterwards. They're not to make the decision. They're to justify the decision. And believe it or not, I've never heard it said quite in that succinctly, that, that said that succinctly. And it's really true. And I loved it. All right. So that's our big second thing is we how to sort of how to handle a first meeting and specifically blending up some content that Todd and I talked about with the snowball system there. Man, prepare. Get that dynamic meeting prep form. You get it for free with Snowball System. Get that. Prepare for meetings thinking about what's your working hypothesis, what's your question you got going in, what's the incremental step you think you can get to, how can you create follow-ups out of it, how can you create curiosity between this meeting and the next one, those kind of things, and really hone in on the questions you're going to ask and and where you think it's going to go as opposed to starting with yourself. All right, so that's the second second thing. The, The third thing, I really like this. Todd's idea that we covered this in the Hacking Your Habits episode, the last one. Go back and listen to that if you want more. And and also it's in the Accidental Creative. But what he calls a head-to-head. How do you you structure an ongoing series of meeting with somebody trying to go through what what you're going through? Specifically applied to business development. So who's somebody that's about at the same level you are, that, that, that is working on business development and growth skills, and that you could partner with to have a series of ongoing meetings to share what you're learning, to expose each other to new ideas, to give you stimuli. You know, one of the things that that um, that Todd talks about a lot in his in his five part model to be creative. And how can you help each other? And then the piece we might add is maybe adding an accountability partner hook to it as well. So let's say. Uh, to be precise, let's say you've got somebody else that you that you admire as a human being, you'd love to spend more time around, you're both learning business development right now, you're at about the same level, whether it's just starting out or you're at the highest level of the game. And let's say you schedule a, a 30 minute meeting once a month where each person's gonna give 10 or 15 minutes of content, meaning they're gonna teach what they're learning that month to the other. You flip the script and you do it the other way. So maybe that's 10 minutes a piece or 20 minutes. And then maybe you've got 10 minutes at the end to talk about, hey, here are the things I'm going to do in the next month. And I want you, accountability partner, head-to-head partner, I want you to hold my, hold me accountable to those. So a simple structure could be 30 minutes once a month. Once a month one person teaches what they're most excited about and what they've learned in the past month. The other one teaches their 10 minutes. And now you got five minutes and five minutes at the end to say, here's what I'm going to do next month. We like picking three big things. And um, I want you to hold myself accountable to that. I'm going to let you know via email before the next meeting whether I did my three things or I didn't. And then the, the last five minutes is mostly prospective. You want to spend your time in meetings, um, mostly spending time talking about the future. And then what's going to fall out of that is the other person might say, okay, man, that's great. So you got two out of three last month. Dude, what's going on? You got to get that third thing. You got to get three out of three. And... Um, and then the other person does the same. Boy, you get three out of three. Great job. What's going to happen as you share your three things is you're going to notice ways that you can be helpful to other. Oh, you know what? I think Sue's solved that that second thing that's on your list for, for next month. Sue did that exact thing. She's on my team. I know you don't know her. How about I introduce you? Because I think she could help you solve that exact problem because she did it like six months ago. Okay, yeah, that'd be great. So not only does the sharing of the three things spark accountability, because you don't want to let your partner down. Um, But also you'll see ways that you can help each other because you're going through this journey together. So you don't have to use that exact um, agenda. That's just an idea. You could do this monthly. Um, Our weekly process we talk a lot about is is weekly where you pick three things a week. I was thinking that might be a bit much much to meet with an accountability partner um, and share the content ideas. But, but maybe you have a, a weekly meeting focused on accountability and that's only 15 minutes and you have a monthly longer meeting, maybe even make it longer if you want, that's really more about sharing ideas. You could structure this any way you want, but, but the general idea is go through this journey with somebody else. Um, it's going to let you be transparent. 
It's going to let you be vulnerable. It's going to let you uh, ping somebody else in the in-between times, like, hey, I'm struggling with this. What would you do? And as you get more into learning about what each other is doing, where they're trying to go, I think that is a wonderful way to keep the focus on business development and keep the focus on the idea that this is a long-term process. This is the project that never ends. This is the business development is the project that you're always striving to just get some incremental improvement and going through it with somebody else to have a, a, <clears throat> a lens of um, what are we learning? How can we get better? And then a little bit of accountability. That could be an incredibly powerful way to keep the focus on BD and, and keep improving to keep climbing in a fun way to share with somebody else. So those are my three big things. One is like creativity, business development is a process, one. Thing two was how specifically, tons of practicality here about how to handle a first meeting. And I absolutely loved how Todd handled this. That's in the, that's in the episode called Create and Close More Opportunities. So go back and catch that um, if you want more on that. But I loved that. And then this third idea, Todd's words head to head, our words are more accountability partner. This could be an incredibly powerful way to to create and close more business, to, to deepen relationships, and, and to really focus on that third thing we talk about a lot, to grow your career because you're getting better at business development. So I hope you enjoyed this. This is a little longer recap episode than I, re than I usually do, but there was so much great content uh, from Todd and that I loved about the accidental creative that I felt like it was worth a little bit more of a meaty summary, if you will. So if you haven't checked out the Snowball System, go grab that. Tons of worksheets and tools. There's almost 25, I think, that you get as part of the book. Um, if you haven't checked out Accidental Creatives or Hurting Tigers or Motivation Code or Todd's other books, um, go back and check out those. Love his work. Love what he's doing. And personally, I can speak for Accidental Creative. I really liked it. I love the fresh mnemonic um, focus, relationships, energy, stimuli, and hours on how to be more creative because there's a tons of applicability to that in my world, trying to be a creator, but, but, but also one that's doing business development. So hope you love this series. Uh, look for next week. We're going to have even more. And I just so enjoy working on these with you. And if you enjoy it, share it with others. And I hope that you get a lot out of this stuff. All right. Talk to you soon and we'll see you in the next episode.